we go. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the Poverty Reduction Policy Development Committee, which we are holding remotely and which is being recorded. Um, I will need to take apologies for absence first, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Apologies from um, Andrew Davis. The gentleman's going to be co-opted onto the committee and us an agenda further on, but he's not able to join us today. Okay. Thank you. Um, do we have any disclosures of personal and prejudicial interest? No. Okay, can we turn to the minutes of the last meeting? Can somebody who was there please agree that they're correct record? Who was at the last meeting? <laughs> yeah. I was. Am I allowed to move them as chair? Yeah. Thank you. OK, so I'll move them and Peter will second them. Thank <clears> you. <throat> right, OK. So um, next. We. Sorry, I've just realised I'm looking at the wrong agenda. I'm looking at my agenda from September. That's no good. What's next on the agenda, Alison? Uh, the terms of reference are uh, attached just for information. And then we have bear with me. Uh, a discussion then um, on the co-option of Andrew Davis is item five. Thank you. So um, Andrew Davis has uh, agreed to to be invited to join us on the um, committee again this year. I found his contributions and support very helpful last year, so um, I would like to move that Andrew is, is co-opted again this year. Can somebody second that, please? I'll Thank second. You, Ryland. Oh. Ryland seconded. Thanks. And then um, we should take a vote. So I suppose it's easiest if anybody says that they're anyone objecting. No. Can I just have a show of hands in favour? On the camera. OK, Aled, will that do? That's fine. I mean, the way that it's been done in um, other committees is that each person <laughs> gives their their vote. So as you have um, one, two, three, four, is it seven councillors on, on, on the, from what I can see? If, if, if you go through each one in turn and, and I, people either say, uh, whoever's got the vote either says um yeah i agree or or i disagree then then we can count that that way okay well i think everybody everybody present who has a vote has got their camera on and we can see all their hands so i think that's going to be quicker if we just do a literal show of hands <coughs> like that. five then is it five that's, all agree five that's everyone, I six, yeah. one, that's everyone three, who's here four. Five. I thought I saw six just now, but five, yeah. Five approved. With no dissent, six, yeah. Six of us. Six. It will be six. Be six. There are so six. Me, Kelly Rob, Leslie Walsh, no. well, Christine Richards. <coughs> and again, it's okay. Everyone who's present. So. So Andrew is duly co-opted. I'm just waiting for my the right agenda to open because I had the wrong one open. Chair, the next yeah. item on the agenda is a discussion on dates and time for future meetings. Thank you very much. OK, okay so um, we are in the habit of meeting at half past three on a Monday, generally towards the end of the month. But I would like to propose that we um, look to reorganise any meetings that fall in school holidays, because even in these very strange times, school holidays still matter to the children. And um, yeah, it, I, I'm finding that difficult. So I, I would like to ask Democratic Services to go through and advise on any meeting dates that do fall in school holidays so that they can be moved to a different point in time. OK, um, 
also we have over the last year um, realized that there's there's a clear logistical difficulty in working on draft policies in the space of formal public meetings because the draft papers themselves can't go through the usual sign-off processes for publication which means that um, I mean, and this is why our terms of reference allow for working groups to take place um, in between or away from the formal public meetings so um, I would like to hear members views on how we arrange this I think that we need to have a working group meeting at least once a month um, and the question is whether they should be in addition to our formal public meetings or from time to time instead of the formal public meetings so if they're in addition that sees a diary commitment that potentially doubling doesn't it you know it you know that we're having two meetings a month um, and in some months it may be that we don't have any formal business to conduct and we could forego the formal meeting but in some months it might be necessary to have the both so I, I would like to open a discussion about that and see how members feel about that Leslie I'd suggest that perhaps uh, we could timetable both and then based on where we are with whatever it is we're working on, we can decide each month which of both we need to carry on with. At least that way we've got them in our diaries so they're there ready for us to take it um, up or not as the case may be. That's what I reckon. Yeah, good idea. Thank you. Ryland? Put your microphone on, Ryland. Um. Sorry, I was just saying that I'm quite happy to attend the two meetings a month, one public, one working group. Um, I don't think it's a, you know, for me, it's not a problem. Thank you, Kelly. Um, my suggestion would be that they were to the um, timetable to run concurrently one after the other, possibly. If there was a need to cancel one, then it wouldn't be a case of that we've um, tied up ourselves for two different days out of the month, for example. If that's possible. OK, you're very quiet, Kelly. Um, OK, Christine. Yeah, just to agree, really, with two forms of meetings. I think the uh, working groups are probably integral to, um, you know, to, to, to the work that we're trying to do as a, as a policy development committee. Um, and as you say, um, potentially most of our work is going to be about unfinished stuff, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, I agree with meeting once a week um, as, as uh, you know, as, uh, as a working group. I think Kelly's idea of having it on the same day probably will save a lot of grief for people. So I'd support that as well. Thank you. Um. Right. OK. Kelly, did you want to come back in again? No. Aled? Can I just clarify? I believe the Councillor Richard said um, once a week uh are these meetings held once a month or are they held she weekly? Meant, she meant once a month they were, I, I, I certainly did mean once a month sorry i've been that's, locked up too long that's all thank you yeah. yeah it's okay peter did you want to come in uh yes just quickly chair again like others i'm content to fit in with whatever pattern we decide upon uh, the one query I might have is in relation to will we always know when we need a working group meeting? I mean, in the very nature of the policy development process uh, through working groups, which I think is welcome, we won't always know. But I guess we can schedule one in and then again always cancel if we find we don't need to use it in any particular month. So yes, fully supportive. Thank you. Um, so are we saying that we would like to book in let me just let me just clarify so um we would like to designate alternate meeting slots that are currently booked in for formal meetings as working groups instead so that it's not an additional burden in the diary is that what you suggested kelly yeah okay um 
I, I think that we might not get through the work if we do it on that basis. Um, I think there are going to be some months when we might have to have the two. Um, but I wonder if we could have them around the same sort of time. So, um, you know, if we keep, if we say that we are allocating 3.30 till 5 for PDC business, we might need to plan ahead and have maybe a very short formal meeting for any formal business that needs to happen and then have the remainder of the time for working group or vice versa as the workload requires month. Um, I should think an hour and a half every month would be enough as long as we are disciplined yeah and allocate the time between formal and working groups as as needed does that sound acceptable to everybody yeah okay so in that case um i will ask democratic services to advise on any that fall in the school holidays and to suggest different dates. and the suggestion of different dates might be tricky because some of us will have other pdcs that might fall on other possible slots so i'll need democratic services to advise on when we could fit them in avoiding any other clashes um, and then other than that, in the run up to those meetings, we will decide how much of the time will be allocated to the formal meeting and how much to a working group. OK. Great, thank you all very much. So the next item on the agenda. Um, sorry, is sorry, Mary, can I just yeah. quickly suggest I would suggest do it the formal bit first, followed by the working group each time. Because then whenever you've got rid of the formal bit, any officers present can then go and then the rest of us can stay. It makes more sense that way because otherwise you don't know when to invite the officers back, do you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, right. Yes. I'm yeah. talking. Yeah, so sorry. I'll, I'll shut up. Good idea. Yes. Thank you. We will. We'll do it that way around. Um, OK, so the next item on the agenda is a presentation from Joe. Um, as an update on where we're up to with various policies and pieces of work. Are you there, Joe? I am, yes, great. Thank you, Mary. Um, now, we've got a presentation to share. I'm not quite sure how I do that on Teams. Is it a button I need to press or? You can share screen, can you? Um, right, the share. For the screen, there's a Don't square scenario pointing up. Share right. content. Share content. OK, I'll, I'll give it a go then because I've got the presentation open. Let's give it a go. It'll come up with a bunch of, of windows that you've got open and you can pick which one you want to share with us. Oh, typical, the one that I want mm. to share. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. It's not happening. Uh, for some reason, the presentation won't open. Has anyone got any advice about this? Do you want to email it to me, Joe, and I'll try sharing it? Yeah, OK. Mary, I think I emailed it to you, but I can email it to Anthony yeah. in the intro. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I've just uh, shared it on screen. Oh, great. Yeah. All right. Okay. I thought it was magic. <laughs> I, I am magic. Of course. <laughs> forgot. forgot for a moment. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Can can everybody see the full screen? I can only see half the screen on mine, but I can manage, I think. Uh, full screen, my side. Yeah, Alison, if you can change it to slideshow view, I think that would be better. Yeah, yeah, that's great. OK, that's lovely. Thanks, Thank Alison. You. Thanks for your help. Thank you. OK, so I'm just going to give you a brief update on where we are with the various policies that the Poverty Reduction um, de uh, Policy Development Committee worked on last year. 
So there were three sort of key policies, promoting affordable credit, the corporate debt policy and the green fairness policy. And I'm not going to go into the detail of, um, you know, the content of each policy, but just to give you an update in terms of where we are in the process of turning them into policy. We could have the next slide, please, Alison. OK, so promoting affordable credit policy, um, just to recap, the aims of this policy is to end the targeting of high cost credit, prevent high cost borrowing and promote access to a more equitable and affordable credit. The cabinet member signed this off or she signed this off quite a while ago. And the next stage is, is that it's going to go to CMT as part of the consultation process. Um, I think this has been scheduled for the 4th of November. So hopefully if that goes ahead, we'll be able to produce a corporate report and it'll go to a corporate briefing in January and then be fed into the policy process. So in terms of, um, you know, feedback for the committee, it's a case of really just being updated on progress in terms of the policy rather than sort of further refinements. If I can have the next uh, slide, please, Alison. The corporate debt policy, um, this was a lot uh, larger than the promoting affordable credit policy, and it was essentially about making it easier to pay bills, to encourage residents who have got financial difficulties to make contact early with the council, to offer help when needed or to signpost to relevant organisations that can provide advice and support and to avoid any further action and ensure a fair and consistent practice to collect in debts. Um, this, the revenue and benefits manager developed quite a, a long, long draft policy and he did this in consultation with various departments such as housing, um, schools and it really was quite a comprehensive document. When a small working group looked at the policy, we felt that um, what was needed was actually a shorter, more concise policy statement and that maybe the, the work within the larger policy could perhaps be um, developed as a uh, operational guidance for staff. So there is a shorter policy statement and this will need further development by a working group that was looking at that, that policy before it then goes on to um, the cabinet member for further um, discussion. So next slide please Alison. Okay, the green fairness policy. Um, so this aims to improve green fairness by increasing opportunities for people to benefit from contact nature and reduce inequalities. Essentially, it's about ensuring that people in deprived communities have equal access to the green infrastructure and the benefits of nature. Developed a draft policy. So policy we felt was really important to involve others um, outside the council who have more expertise in this area so a working group um, with members of the PSB working uh, with nature group uh, fed into this policy and helped refine the policy we've got a final draft um, but again this needs to be reviewed before it goes to the relevant cabinet member or cabinet members um, so it is more or less done, but we need that sort of final review before it sort of proceeds. So that's really just to give you sort of like an update where we are with the three policies, because um, they've taken a fair amount of work through both through the committees and the working groups. So I just wanted to update the uh, committee on where we are with the uh, process of them being turned into policies. OK. That's great. Thanks. Alison, can you leave the slides up for a minute, please? And. Um... Um, I think what we'll do is, can, yeah, if we skip back to here, yeah, that's perfect. We can just have a quick chat about where we're up to in the next stages and I'll take members' views of, of anything that we need to do next, OK? Uh, Ryland, you've got your hand up, though. Did you want to come in now? Sorry, right. Yeah, sorry. Um, it was just looking at the affordable credit policy with the time, uh, time, time, um, indicators there that it won't go to corporate brief until January, etc. Um, when we talked about this earlier in the year, one of the main drivers was the idea that we would get some of these things sorted out before Christmas. Um, and I understand we're all delayed because of virus and all that sort of stuff. But even if it goes to corporate briefing in January and then it goes to cabinet sometime after that, it's probably not going to be um, a proper policy adopted by the cabinet until probably March time 
Um, and for this year, we'll have missed one of the big um, time periods when people are looking for credit, etc., which is the run, run up to Christmas. Um, so I just know it's a bit of disappointment, really, that you know we're going to period when for credit, etc. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Ryan. And that is a really, really good and important point, especially when you consider the fact that actually we finished work on this policy in January uh, this year, January. So I, I'm, I'm guessing that's a typo on the slide, Joe. I should say cut briefing January 2021. Oh, yes, sorry, yes, yes, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. actually, January 2020 is when we finished this and it was yeah. ready to progress. So indeed it is very disappointing. Um, and I'm not I'm not really sure what we can do about that. I, I think if the rest of the committee agrees, um, I will speak to the cabinet member and ask her to talk with the leader about how we might possibly um, you know, expedite some action in relation to this, even if it if it I mean I suppose what I want to say is, can we effectively start rolling out the actions within the policy, even though the policy itself hasn't yet been formally adopted? You know, and I, I don't think that's a, a hugely controversial thing to suggest. I think that the council often, you know, does good work, even though it isn't yet grounded in a policy context. And in fact, that was the rationale behind this policy in the first place was that, um, you know, we had already done so much on on tackling um, high interest lending um, and we've already banned payday loan adverts from council computers um, and so it might be that there are some actions that we'd like to see taken forward that that the cabinet would be supportive of of us kind of ex escalating and expediting even in advance of the policy itself being formally adopted can i have any thoughts on that please ryland well um it would be good if we get um, things like adverts for the credit union on pay slips again this year. I don't know how valuable that is now, bearing in mind we're already at the end of October. Um, but in previous years, the, the pay slips for, say, December, January have had adverts on them for uh, the credit union. Um, and I think that would be a good, and, and, and it's a relatively easy way of um, getting the message out to staff in particular you know if you're looking for money credit at this time of year consider your credit union sort of thing um, yeah okay well I, I will say that actually the credit union message became pretty much permanent on staff pay slips I, I think certainly during you know the last few years that I was an officer that that message was on pay slips most of the time and I think um, there was actually an agreement made with payroll services that that was the default pay slip message um, and it would only not be there if there was something else instead now the fact is that that did relate to laser credit union which ceased to exist and I don't know if an alternative pay slip message has ever been agreed so that is something that I will ask Anthony to follow up um, I think messages on pay slips are also perhaps less impactful now than they used to be because pay slips are all electronic. Uh, I think when you used to get a little slip of paper in your pigeonhole, it was different. Um, but I think that we can use StaffNet and we can use the Chief Exec's blog and other opportunities to promote the credit union to members of staff. And I think it will be helpful for the cabinet member if we give her a list of actions that we might ask for her to get the leader support with. So yeah, that could be one for sure. Um, I, I see Leslie and Christine have both got their hands up. I'm not sure who was first. I'm just going to ask Christine first, please. Oh, thank you. Um, just, just an idea, Ria. I know that we were talking about um, uh, promulgating the message to staff using payslips and staff net and all the rest of it. But I think it's important to get the message about credit unions out to the public at large as well. And we need to, you know, I, I, I think there's some quick wins with that. Our council website is an obvious uh, uh, place to, to, to advertise or, you know, or, or to put some kind of message in the lead up to Christmas. And also, I think that um, next year we'll be looking at what we include with the council tax bills. 
and looking at the timing for this, if we're looking at it not going to corporate briefing until January and then on to cabinet, any um, you know any ideas and any and, and and any decisions? It strikes me if we want to put a message in with the council tax bills, uh, which go out to all households, um, would um, you, you know we'd miss the boat on that. So I, I I would suggest that if we want to promulgate that message to the public at large, there's probably something we need to do, you know, out with the you know outside the the time scales that we've got that we've got listed at the moment. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Leslie? Uh, yeah, I totally endorse everything that Ryland and Christine have just said. Um, I think it's an absolute must that we try and um, promote credit unions and definitely public, not just our own staff. I was just wondering if via the cabinet member we could perhaps push for um, at least a press release as well to promote, I don't know how many of you have seen this, uh, the tenancy save a loan scheme that the Welsh Government have put forward where they're working with seven credit unions across Wales to help people who get into financial difficulties with rent and to, to point them in the direction of credit unions to try and help them get affordable loans so that they do not end up getting evicted. And I think what we could be doing as a council, saying that this is the kind of the initiative that the Welsh Government are doing, that we fully support and are pleased to see if this is going, it's going to um, in any respect, stopped people from being evicted, certainly towards the Christmas period. So I'd, I'd like perhaps for us to uh, see if that's a possibility by um, mentioning it to the Cabinet member as well. Thank you. OK, thanks, Leslie. Would you please circulate some information about that scheme that you've just mentioned? Um, the, the one with helping tenants? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll circulate it the whole group. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask Anthony and Joe to be making a note of these actions, please. Yeah, for further discussion with the cabinet member. Um, Anthony. Hi, thanks, Mary. I thought I'd, um, you know, excellent suggestions. And I thought um, I would add by just to let you know what we are doing currently to support Swansea Bay Credit Union. Um, they are uh, well. It was it was happening last month. They were planning their Christmas loans take up campaign uh, in Swansea, Neath Patolba as well, and um, through the Tackling Poverty Service and um, through Welsh Government funding um, relating to the Employability Support and Legacy Fund, we're able to support um, the credit union with that campaign. Um, as we've done in, in previous years. So we are we're meeting them halfway with the cost of that campaign. Um, they are having 50,000 leaflets printed, which will be distributed to um, uh, directly to households in our highest uh, deprivation areas in Swansea. Um, and I am having ongoing uh, conversations with uh, Swansea Bay Credit Union. I've offered, already made an offer when they start doing their, um, which should be imminently, but when they start doing their social media campaigns around the Christmas loans um, campaign that we would, I would tie that in with our corporate communications and, and help to circulate uh, those messages wider for them. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that that was happening. That's great. Thanks very much, Anthony. And I think it, it makes the important point that this policy actually came after a high interest credit um, lending plan, you know, and, and all credit to the previous PDC prior to, to me being in the chair who, who developed and, and oversaw the rollout of that plan. Um, so I think those are going to be important things to, to include. I think it would be really good if we do get some stuff on staff debt, something in the chief execs blog and some communication out to councillors. Um, which perhaps points to messages that are already out there and actions that are already happening just to make sure that they get maximum publicity and that everybody is fully aware of them. I think that would be really helpful. Um, OK, is everyone content if we move on to the next policy for discussion now? 
Yeah, OK, thanks, Alison. Can we just hop forward? Thank you. OK, so the corporate debt policy, um, the, the relevant cabinet member here um, is the leader. The leader holds the cabinet portfolio for finance. Um, and he is he's very um, happy to support us with moving forward with a policy that proposes um, quite a, a shift in approach uh, to, to collecting corporate debt. Um, the, the council tax letter, which went out quite recently, um, as everybody will recognise that that in itself, well, the first departure from the norm was to was to not pursue any arrears for quite some time. Um, and then the next stage was was the letter kind of um, inviting people to contact us and offering help and support and clearly saying uh, that we as a council recognise the stress that everybody is under at this time and not wanting their council tax arrears to add to that burden. Now, fundamentally, I think the feeling of this committee yeah. is that that should be our approach all the time in regards to all debts. And that's not to say that we shouldn't pursue them. Obviously, the coronavirus situation is a, a particular set of circumstances and it was right to, to hold off and, and delay on, on debt recovery processes. Um, but to say that whenever a, a resident of Swansea does fall into debt, there is the potential for the stress to be overwhelming and there is an opportunity for us to say that we want to help. Um, and that's really the fundamental crux of this new policy that we want to put in place. So, um, although Joe's presentation um, quite rightly focuses on these specific pieces of work, which we're hoping to get signed off in due course, it is important to remember that this particular policy was preceded by quite a lot of work looking at letters, um, and the way that we go about um, debt recovery, Leslie in particular did some great work suggesting um, amendments to, to letters that are sent out when people fall into arrears with their rent. Um, and the rent team was, was warm to that and open to that. But really what we want is a policy that sets that as a standard across the board for all departments that are corresponding with people about their debts to have to use simple language um, really inviting the person to get in touch and and be assured of you know a, of a of a constructive and, and supportive response um, because that isn't the way that the council has typically communicated with people in the past. So um, I think as Joe mentioned in her presentation, we are at the point now of needing another working group to look specifically at, at this piece of work. So I'm happy to timetable this for our next general working group meeting, which will look at all the work that we have outstanding, or we can look at a particular working group um, just looking at this more rapidly. Um, can I have some indications from members about which they think would be the best approach and if anybody would like to be in a small working group looking specifically at this, please. Anybody? Ryland? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say I'm quite happy to be part of a smaller working group if that would help uh, move things forward. Thank you. Christine? Yes, also happy. Thank you. Les? Same here. Same. Right, OK. Um, in that case, what I'll do is I'll suggest that the four of us um, meet to look at what um, Anthony and Joe have got for us at this point and we can um, kick it around and then we bring back, we bring that then back to the, the main working group meeting consisting of all members for further discussion uh, prior to moving forward. Is that okay? So we will timetable in a specific meeting for that, away from the normal PDC meeting cycle. Thank you very much. Um, Alison, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, the green fairness policy. I have sent the latest draft out to everyone. This has already um, been looked at by a small working group and um, I feel it, it's it's pretty much complete. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we just put this on the agenda for our next main working group meeting 
unless there's anything that anybody wants to say about it at this point. Ryland. No, you had your hand up from before. OK, fine. Yeah, Does sorry. Any... No problem. Does anybody have anything to say about the recently circulated draft of the Green Fairness Policy? Sir? Yes, thank you, Mary. Just briefly, first of all, just to confirm, I think it's an excellent document, um, but you don't want to be sitting there hearing me say that. Um, <clears throat> my point in relation to this document is that, of course, it's setting out to prioritise low income areas. And that's perfectly understandable and to be welcome given the proven research link between health and access to green space and the natural world and so on. But of course, much of the paper itself is applicable right across Swansea. It's not just applicable to low income areas, it's applicable generally, whether we're talking about enhancement of biodiversity, whether we're talking about air quality, um, whether we're talking about active travel, whether we're talking about drainage and flood risk management and so on. So the point I want to make is that whilst in terms of resource allocation, where practicable, I guess the meaning of this policy is that priority will go to areas of deprivation. We mustn't lose sight of the fact that these environmental objectives, and after all, much of what is in this paper is taken from the corporate uh, plan. It's taken from the Wellbeing Act and so forth. These are things that are applicable generally, and there are going to be occasions when, in terms of resource scarcity, a judgment might have to be made between an area of deprivation, if you like human deprivation, and an area that needs biodiversity enhancement and improvement that can't perhaps be delivered in that area of human deprivation. So it's an excellent paper, but I think we need to recognise, we can discuss it when we meet uh, at our next, on the next occasion, uh, that I think there needs to be some recognition that areas of deprivation can't always be in the highest priority. There may, occasion, may be occasions when another priority has to take precedence over deprivation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, I think that what would be helpful is um, to, well, just to remember that this committee is about poverty. This committee is about pov poverty reduction and for us, an element of poverty reduction is improving um, green space and green infrastructure in deprived areas. So that, that doesn't mean that every resource that comes into the council for green infrastructure is going to go into deprived areas, but it means that the question will be asked in the first instance, can it go into a deprived area? And if it, if it can, then probably it should. So. Um, Andrew Davis, although he was unable to be with us today, has provided me with a, a bit of feedback on this draft and his concern is that it, it isn't clear on how success will be measured um, and exactly what the intended outcomes are. So I just think it could benefit from the addition of a small sentence or paragraph clarifying that that is for the work of the action plan. That at the action planning stage, we will be very clear on what success measures we are putting in place. and. Um, I think it's worth bearing in mind that obviously the outcome that we are aiming for ultimately is for people to be healthier and happier, but this is very slippery to measure and um, it's more likely that we can have very concrete um, outputs to measure as in terms of success, such as you know that nobody sh nobody should live more than 30 meters away from a tree, you know, or, or, or something, something like that. Um, I think, yeah, as long as the policy places the burden um, in the action planning stage on, um, on, on making sure that success is measurable. I think that that, that would be really helpful. And I think that there's space to frame that in the policy itself. Peter, you wanted to come in again? Yeah, very quickly, Mary, so I should have made this point before. Action plan, who or what body is going to be responsible for developing that action plan? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. And that is something that we perhaps should also phrase and put actually stated in the policy. And we need to discuss that. I, I, I would I would suggest it would be those those council departments that are involved in the PSB working with Nature Working Group, that they might feel differently about that. I do think there will be benefit in the policy of actually naming them. And I think that's a really good point to raise. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Leslie. Um, I was 
just, just following on immediately from Peter's last question, I think we would have a role, but um, I, I, th I think we would be part of that discussion. Maybe we might um, um, uh, look at it and put some suggestions forward, but I think also officers would have a role in that because after all, they're the ones who are going to actually have to carry out and adhere to the policy. So I, I would suggest it's going to be a combination of people that are going to get involved, but starting with us, I would have thought, OK, fair enough. I think that this is something that we can toss around a bit more in the working group and we can involve some of the officers who've helped us with uh, developing the policy so far in that discussion. OK, Ale, do you have your hand up? I shouldn't have, I'm sorry. OK, that's fine. <laughs> am, I still, am I still got my hand up? Yeah, no, sorry. It's gone now, thanks. Oh, um, right, OK. Uh, so we're looking, we're looking at this in our next working group meeting and that's that's fine and we're done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your help with the presentation, Alison, and thank you for preparing it and giving it to us, Joe. OK, so the next item on our agenda today is about Swansea Food Poverty Network. This is a brilliant development that I'm so glad to hear about, and I've asked Anthony to give us um, a presentation on it. You will remember that our, um, our work plan for last year included um, not necessarily driving anything forward on the food poverty agenda, but keeping um, a watching brief on it and remaining aware of what was going on in the world of, of food poverty, food banks, food distribution, like fair share and stuff like that. But we wrote that work plan before this thing called coronavirus happened and then everything changed. And of course, the council has been quite um, heavily involved in the distribution of, of emergency food and a lot of um, resources have sprung up that didn't exist um, when we first wrote our work plan. So Tony has got a presentation to bring us up to date with that. Over to you, Tony. Uh, thanks, Mary. Um, first of all, I should uh, I should say that I, I don't actually have a presentation to share with you this afternoon, uh, but you have been circulated uh, a brief report, which I will I will uh, talk through just just to give the overview. Um, so I, the the report starts off really with a little bit of background. Um, obviously, we've we've had the COVID nineteen pandemic this year, and the council very early on uh, when that pandemic hit, identified food uh, and access to food as was one of the priorities um, that we would be that we would be focusing on. And a, a lot of work has happened uh, around that uh, in terms of supporting food banks, supporting hot meals uh, provision to people who are homeless or vulnerably housed. I'm not going to go into the detail <clears throat> of all the work that has uh, taken place um, during, during COVID in, in terms of food, but I'm just merely uh, pointing out that, uh, that it really has heightened the work that has, that has gone on this year in supporting people to access food. Uh, further to that, at the end of last year, um, we received some funding from Welsh Government um, to support organisations that are in food poverty and involved in um, supporting people who are in food poverty. And we awarded uh, a total of 26 grants through two different rounds um, to organisations in Swansea. And that was at the end of last year. And they were those organisations were at the point where they were starting or just about to make um, make it start delivering on on the grants that they received on their proposals. And at the time, at the beginning of the pandemic, we, we showed a lot of flexibility with that grant so that organisations could uh, reallocate that, that money, obviously still within the terms and conditions of the grant, but in light of the COVID pandemic. So a lot, a lot has happened this year in, in terms of food support. And one of the things that uh, has come out of that, and indeed from, the, uh, from a report that we had um, commissioned in um, to look at how that uh, that grant uh, was administered and what impact it would have it and through engaging with all the organizations that are involved in the food poverty agenda there was a lot of interest in bringing that group together it was a group of organizations and representative representatives of organizations who weren't getting together to share knowledge share experience uh, and collaborate so 
as we were coming, as as the uh, the crisis uh, point in in COVID sort of settled down a little bit, I started putting together um, a list of contacts um, to form the Swansea Food Poverty Network, and I sent out uh, an email um, to them all, basically asking two two kind of key questions really. How would a Swansea Food Poverty Network support their work? And how would a Swansea Food Poverty Network benefit Swansea? And it was had really great response to that. Lots of um, lots of in-depth answers from, from lots of people. And the key themes that came out from that are, are in the in the report there that you've got. It's those two two diagrams. And the first uh, the first diagram. Um, is about pulling out the key themes about how the Swansea Food Poverty Network could support their work. So that the, the central theme was around collaboration and supporting each other. And the themes around that um, were about information, sharing resources, um, supporting effective referral processes, supporting volunteers, understanding what is available and who it's available to, um, coordination and then filling gaps, linking to wider support for people, ensure and ensuring that people know how to access help. And then the second question, which was um, how could Swansea Food Poverty Network um, benefit Swansea? The key thing theme that came out of that was nobody goes without. And then the themes around that were around uh, services being coordinated, resilient. Uh, communication is effective and practical. Uh, supplies and resources are accessible and shared. Um, there's good reach and access to food um, food, food support. Um, services are responsive. People are supported and empowered. And that we monitor trends and demands and learn about what that means so that we can continue to collaborate and, and, and plan better on, on the food agenda. So the first meeting was organised for the 6th of October, which we held teams and it was it was well attended. I didn't know how many were going to attend. I think we invited around 50 people and I think we had probably about um, half that number that, in, that were able to attend the meeting and we pulled we, we took that information that they'd already submitted and developed the early um, start of an action plan. So the, the key themes that came out of that action some kind of communication, but also communications to the public. Um, the importance of a mapping exercise, uh, looking at better referral processes, maximizing goodwill and supporting volunteers, better partnership working, and, and again, understanding demands and trends. So very much the, um, just backing up, very much the, the approach that um, I took with uh, setting up the Swansea Food Poverty Network was that as a council officer and a representative of, of, of Swansea Council, our role is to facilitate and support that collaboration happening. So I very much see it that the Swansea Food Poverty Network is owned by its members. Um, I'm facilitating them to collaborate and work work smarter, if you like, um, and try and tease that out so that we can look at what that whole picture looks like across Swansea and have the partners work in a bit smarter together to um, improve the provision and access for people. So the members decided that meetings should take place place monthly, at least initially, uh, while, while this pandemic is happening. So. Um, I've set them up for the first Tuesday of every month. Membership, uh, obviously, um, I targeted those who are directly involved in um, food poverty uh, provision support. Also, we have membership from other support agencies. So, for example, Citizens Advice are invited and other, net, other uh, advice and support agencies that kind of provide that wraparound support so that um, the food banks and those organisations involved in food support can actually make those links and, and the referral process that they use then to support people uh, in the wider sense. So I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that this is happening. I think um, absolutely now is the time to do that. And I'm already seeing benefits from that happening. We've set up um, already set up a private Facebook group um, for members uh, to join. 
bit more work to encourage uh, taking up of that and sharing of information. But already there's lots of um, information coming to me as the coordinator of that group to be shared wider with the other members and we're already seeing the benefits of that. So I'm really pleased this is happening and i um, happy to share that with you. Happy to take any questions or, or, or suggestions or priorities or, or thoughts from you. Perhaps. Thank you very much, Tony. I'm sorry for introducing that as a presentation. I should, in fact, have been very excited at actually having a formal published report in our agenda pack, which hardly ever happens at these meetings because <laughs> the stuff that we want to talk about isn't isn't ready for signing off. So thank you so much. It's a really, really good report. It's really good to have it written and um, to be able to have it in advance. It was very useful. Um, the Facebook group you mentioned. So um, I, I note that in, in the report, it just says that that was an action was to set one up. And now you've just said that. that How is that going to ask for a little progress update on that group? Um, I've got um, so it's a, pri it's a private group. It's it's a it's for the network members to be able to share other than relying on me um, as, a, as, a, as a as a as a kind of communication hub. It's a little slow. It's on the agenda for the next meeting. There, there are some people that have joined. A handful of keen, enthusiastic uh, people have joined. Um, I think I think there's a couple of posts in there. Um, but in fact, what, what I've had more than that is I've, I've, I've lost count of the number of emails of, you know, can you share this with the other members, whether it's a poster, whether it's an update. It's not just about sharing information. They're also keen to be able to share um, so, for example, if a food bank has a surplus supply or particular items that they'd like to to other food banks to, to put to use, it's that kind of networking ability. I don't mind at the moment if they're using me for that, um, but we've also set up the um, private Facebook group that they, they can use that as well. Um, so I just need to do, I think I probably need to do a little bit of work around um, encouraging take up and encouraging people to join that that group because um the last email i sent out to them regards the the update of of, of the actions that was in there amongst other things so uh, i need to point that out in the next meeting and encourage take up but um it's it's there yeah uh, these things sometimes can be a bit slow starting but i will do what i can to encourage use it was what yeah. the members wanted and what they suggested so i, I set it up yeah, yeah, sounds great. I mean, I, I know from my own experiences with that thing called Swansea Poverty Action Network that you can, it can become a full time job um, forwarding information on <laughs> to other organisations. And actually, if we can come up with a, a mechanism that avoids your inbox getting cluttered with all that stuff and the council servers getting cluttered with all that stuff, I'm sure that that's probably preferable. Um, do any of the members have issues with using Facebook? I mean, is that definitely the best sort of medium? It was uh, they, there was some discussion around, um, you know, do, do we want WhatsApp? Do we want Facebook? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, um, act as the facilitator of, of making what their recommendation is happen. Um, I'm going to, you know, engage them in further discussion on on that. If they decide to use a different uh, channel or platform for, for doing that, then, you know, I can I can make that happen also. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to support them to do what they want to to be able to work better. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. OK, fab. And is there anything that we can do to help at this point? Is um, there any, you know, can, can we can we share share information or encourage people to join the network or anything like that? Um, members are welcome to, councillors are welcome to join join the group. Um, I'm not an absolute Facebook uh, expert. It's a private group, so you would have to request to join. Um, as I say, primarily it's for those who are delivering um, food support to be able to share messages with other organisations that are doing doing the same yeah. um, and to ask, you know, if they have questions to pose or um, it's about sharing knowledge and expertise and, and just the practical things. But there's no reason that, you know, if a councillor wanted to join, um, it, it, it is a potentially another way that referrals could, could come in. Yeah. OK, uh, I could send that link um, to to the Facebook group. Um, I'm just saying that when you 
when you join then it, you, you get a couple of questions as to who you are and what, what your reason is for, for joining that and uh, I, I could let you in then. Well, it's, I, I think it's easy to find. It's it's just Swansea Food Poverty Network. You can just yeah, search it for it. Um, but I, I suppose really the councillors that it's going to be most relevant to are those that are directly involved perhaps in their own local food banks or em emergency food um, provision systems. And perhaps it's more about those councillors making sure that somebody from those organisations is already involved um, and is aware of it and, and getting involved. So um, I'm sure that's something that we'll all take note of. Mary involved with his local uh, food bank here in Sketty. Um, but my involvement is particularly with asylum seekers and refugees, not just in Sketty, but right across the city and county. Um, and just I wanted to know, is there a representative or more than one representative of the Swansea Asylum Seeker Support Group in the Food Network? Uh, because if not, then I, I think that's something I'd want to uh, pursue. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yeah, and uh, you know, thank you for just suggesting it and raising it. Yeah, we have um, invited um, someone from that group to represent. I can't think of the name offhand. Um, I apologise. Tom Cheeseman, perhaps. It could be Tom. Yeah, it could be Tom. Okay. Um, pass that on to someone else who who I've been. Um, who I've shared information with uh, and it's is a member. It's more likely to be Wayne, I think, probably. Wayne. Could be, is yes, it could be Wayne. Yeah. Anyway, that's great news and thank you. Thank you, Anthony. No problem. Oh, okay, Les, you want to go in? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, are the LACs, the local area coordinators, linked into this group? Um, I don't think they're on the membership group at the moment, Leslie, but I can add, if I add um, Claire or, or Roman or John. For um, Town Hill Ward, I think that would be the most relevant contact. That's Bethan McGregor. I'm going to I'm going to suggest that I forward this report that Anthony's provided to us over to John Franklin. Um, who's um, the, the LAC program manager and to ask him to discuss it um, with the LACs and for them to, to make their own arrangements about getting involved because definitely in Uplands as well, Les, our, our LAC has been really heavily involved in, in getting food to people who need it. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So, so yeah, I think, I think if we hand the report over to John um, and, and ask him to discuss it with his team and talk about how they get involved and then they can contact Anthony then and take it from there, can't they? That's a really good point, Les. Thanks for raising it. Okay, Chris. No, uh, Leslie's covered it now. I was going to mention the uh, local area coordinators. I was actually going to ask Anthony as well. Um, I haven't had a chance to read. Have you sent us the report? Sorry, or is it in the agenda pack? Yes. Yeah. It's. I yeah. I've I've lost the I've lost my link to the agenda pack off the screen, so I can't I can't see it. So within within your report, does it? It sort of lists the food banks that you have managed to contact because uh, I certainly know of um, you know food banks in our own area, which would have been the old old, old clue area, uh, Gosainen, where Kelly, who's who's in, in the meeting, was heavily heavily involved, Ponte de Lice and 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 all the rest of it. Um, I was just interested really in whether you'd you had you'd, you had a good geographical spread of the people. That, uh, that that are in the group. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, the um, the, the the list of um, of members isn't included in the report. Right. Um, I didn't I didn't include that in the report. Um, it is at the moment, um, as I say, there's around fifty people uh, represent representing organisations within 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 the group. That doesn't mean it's 50 different organizations some organizations might have multiple members in the group it's everyone that i'm aware of um i'm always conscious that there might be groups uh, out there that i'm not aware of um happy to um sh share that information with with you know with with the pdc um you know to encourage if there are any other groups out there that you're aware of that, that yeah. i'm not invited to the group um, to let me know and I can get an invite out. 
Okay. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, Anthony, do you think it's worth asking um, asking the cabinet member to do an email to all councillors, making them aware of the existence of the Food Poverty Network and inviting them to refer any organisations who could benefit from being a member who might not already know about it um, to, to contact you? I think that's an excellent idea, Mary. Thank you very much. Okay, so yeah. You can remind me to do that then. <laughs> you or Joe. Thank you. Uh, right, okay. If there's nothing else on that item, then thank you very much, Tony. Um, the next item then is a discussion of our work plan for the coming period. So uh, members will be aware that um, essentially we are thinking of our time now, not as a single municipal year, but as the full stretch um, of the remainder of this administration. Um, and that the leader has asked for us to produce some um, focused pieces of work that can come through the corporate machinery and be brought forward for adoption um, quite quickly. And obviously, given the discussion we've already had in this meeting about one particular piece of work, which was actually really quick to turn around and was ready a year before it's even going to be able to go to corporate briefing, um, we see some of the typical challenges that we have with, with turning things around quickly. Um, the leader is aware of the discussions that we've had uh, and the, the difficulties that we've had and, and has assured me that senior officers um, are aware that getting PDC work moved forward um, is, is a priority for him and, and we can be assured things moving a little bit more quickly in future. Um, I have circulated a discussion paper um, suggesting some themes um, for, for inclusion in our coming work plan. These are all based on, on a previous discussion that we had uh, in this committee about things that we want to work on. Um, and I think that the challenge really is going to be allocating our time. Um, the areas that we had previously discussed as being of importance to us were um, firstly some sort of poverty proofing, looking at emerging council um, programmes, policies and making sure that we felt they were doing all they could to tackle poverty where relevant. Secondly, something to do with public transport. Now, I am aware that um, a few years ago, uh, Anthony was busy gathering case studies to pass to the transport unit. Um, actual, you know, real life examples of people who felt that their opportunities for training or employment um, were being stifled by the fact that they had no transport and no access to affordable transport. We know that having no transport in times of day on certain days of the week is an issue for a lot of our deprived communities. Um, and I, I don't actually know what the transport unit did uh, with that qualitative information that Tony gave them, um, but I, I'd be quite interested to find out. Um, another area was community food growing. So I would refer to um, page 15 of, of the manifesto on which the current administration was elected says uh, that Swansea Labour will continue to promote the greater provision of allotments and garden sharing, particularly where publicly owned land is available and appropriate for such use. Now, um, that particular piece of work wasn't brought into the corporate plan. There isn't anybody delivering it and it could be something that this group would like to take forward. Um, I would suggest that, actually, I'm just going to whiz through all the headings and then I'll come back and we'll go through one at a time talking about how we think each of these might work. OK, so the next one is credit. Mentioned, this committee feels that they're very, very important. We want to promote them and support them and make sure that everybody knows how beneficial they can be. Um, and the final point was benefit uptake and how important it is to make sure that people in Swansea are claiming everything they're entitled to. So we'll take each of these in turn and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about how we might progress work in the coming year. In terms of poverty proofing, essentially this takes place currently through our um, EIA process. Somebody remind me what EIA stands for? Equality Impact Assessment. Um, now, Swansea's EIA is unusual in that it does invite people to consider the impacts on uh, people on low incomes. 
that isn't something that is required uh, and it isn't something that all local authorities do. However, that means that the poverty proofing aspect of it is only as effective as the EIA process itself. And concerns have been raised, not just in Swansea, throughout Wales, about whether the EIA process really does drive improvements. Um, and locally in Swansea, of course, we have had um, a scrutiny inquiry on equality, which was led by Louise Gibbard, who's now in Cabinet, again, leading on equality issues. A lot of the recommendations from the inquiry that she led are still being implemented. And an important one of those is the creation of a new strategic equalities group. In terms of what this PDC can do then, I would suggest that we would like to be aware of how the new strategic equalities group is shaping up. We would like to be assured that they are equipped for looking at how things impact on people on low incomes um, and perhaps keeping in touch with that group as it develops with regard to poverty proofing. But another thing that this group could do in particular is look at the council's readiness for implementing the socioeconomic duty. So I'm sure that members will all be aware that the socioeconomic duty is an element of the Equality Act, which was basically not put into practice. It was written into the Act, um, but Theresa May decided not to enact it. It has been enacted in Scotland and it is going to be enacted in Wales. So there is some work for us to do in familiarising ourselves with how that is proposed to work and whether we think the council's processes are geared up for it. Obviously, in due course, that will be a matter for scrutiny. Scrutiny will perhaps want to look back and say, how well has this council adopted um, this and how well are we implementing the socioeconomic duty? But in advance of that, the PDC could look at what would be involved in implementing the duty um, and perhaps make some recommendations to this new strategic equality group about how they might like to work. So I think that we could have um, perhaps one or two meetings which are really about learning how the socioeconomic duty is proposed to work, looking at the processes that currently exist in the council and whether we think that they're currently sufficient to make sure that we do a good job of implementing the socioeconomic duty. Um, so I think that that's one element of poverty proofing work that this count that this committee could consider looking at. Can I have some feedback on that suggestion, please? Anybody? Chris. Christine. Sorry. Forgot, got overexcited then. Um, looking at the uh, the Welsh Government web website today and the documents on the um, poverty proofing, I've forgotten the terminology already. See, so, uh, um, I, I, and it seems to me that when you just said uh, about it being a scrutiny issue, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, really, because the policy of what local authorities need to do is already quite clear within the documentation that's coming out from Welsh, Welsh government. Um, uh, checking on whether the council is able to do that or not sounds to me of scrutiny rather than developing a policy. The policy is going to come to us in a package. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Anyone else? Les. Um, I agree totally with what Christine's just said. I feel this is more a role of scrutiny. I think it's something that we're looking at, something that's already exists. And is it working? Is it being carried out? Is it being done properly, etc. OK, thanks. I think the fundamental point is that it doesn't yet exist. The Welsh Government hasn't rolled it out yet and we haven't yet been asked to implement it. Um, having said that, they will. They will insist that we do it and it will, of course, immediately become it will immediately become a, an issue for, for scrutiny um, rather than for us. I've also had a message from uh, Kelly in the chat because her internet is a bit dodgy, but she says that she also agrees with Christine. All that is fine. I think what I'm going to propose is that we do timetable in a presentation um, or discussion on the socioeconomic duty. I just want to make sure that all members of this committee are clear on what it means and um, 
what we can expect to be happening around the authority as a result of it. I think that's something that we're going to want to um, have a good awareness of going forward. So is everyone content that that, that is enough um, for the work plan, for, for the purposes of the work plan? Make sure that we're fully conversant with the socioeconomic duty. Yeah. Great. Yeah. OK, so the next um, the next thing is public transport. Now, I I am mindful that this could potentially be an enormous piece of work at the end of which we could write a policy saying that the council should just set up its own bus company and provide free transport for everybody. That's not very realistic, especially not in the time that we have. So um, the question really is, how can we do a good piece of work on transport that um, we can put forward to the cabinet? Um, that will actually achieve something in the limited time that we do have. And I would suggest um, that offices could provide us with some good information about the limitations of the current transport offering and the barriers that people face as a result of that. I already mentioned some work that I know Tony was doing some years ago, which perhaps he could dig out and share with us. And we could ask the transport unit for their thoughts in response to that. Um, but mainly, uh, Ryland in particular has suggested that we look at community transport and and the role of community transport organizations and provisions in other counties which we don't really have here in Swansea um, have been in touch with the community transport association uk and their regional development worker covering swansea um, she she used to work with us here in swansea council and i'm sure that she would be a very interesting person to have along to a meeting um, to find out more about what the council could do uh, to to promote community transport and support the growth of community transport in the context that we're in currently christine you wanted to come in yeah, it's just that when when uh, when Tony was giving his presentation and he was talking about the Swansea uh, food poverty network, it strikes me that at a low um, at a low community level, there may well be a piece of work to be done pulling together, for example, uh, community cars that are being run in in, in all, all all around these you know the uh, the authority that to get those people together in a group to do the same kind of things as they're doing with the with, with the food poverty network would be a good thing for the council you know to, to help with that yeah that sounds great sounds great i'm sure joe's made a note of that thank you um who had their hand up next was it peter yes thank you mary just quickly many decades ago he says carefully i was a councillor in reading berkshire and in Reading, there had been established a community transport uh, system called ReadyBus, um, which was a scheme run by volunteers. I don't know how it was financed initially, but it was certainly run by volunteers. And basically, people could phone in and book a bus. It was a sort of a 10 passenger or so small uh, bus could phone in, book their bus for a particular place in a particular time. And it would come around, collect them and take them, presumably on some kind of circuitous route to wherever they wanted to go. And that worked extremely well, it was extremely uh, uh, supported, as far as I know, is still running. So I think ReadyBus is certainly a scheme I would recommend that uh, any working group has a look at. The other point I'd like to make, a rather different one, rather differently. Um, I have family down in Exeter and Exeter owns its own bus service. Extra City Council owns and runs its own bus service. Uh, all I can tell you is that quite apart from the fact it works extremely well, the fare levels are approximately half for a similar distance that the privately owned buses here in uh, Swansea are currently charging. So food for thought there as well, I think. Yes, thank you. Um, I know that getting away from the profit motive in the bus industry is something that I, I don't understand enough about myself. Um, and it, it might be that it would be helpful for us to just to have a report or some officer come and explain that to us. I, I do I do understand that when legislation changed uh, to deregulate um, bus services, there was something like if I, I think it was that if a local council was already running a municipal bus service, it was in a better position to be able to continue that 
than a council who didn't already have one being in to try and set one up. Um, and I understand that Welsh Government is looking at changing all of that. I really think it would be helpful, perhaps even if we aren't looking at, look, at doing a big, a big piece of work like that, it would perhaps still be useful for this committee to have a better understanding of that situation. Um, so maybe that's something that we could timetable in. Les, you've been wanting to come in, haven't you? Yeah, a couple of things. Just following on, um, Paul Lloyd has done a lot of work in the past looking at public transport. And the impression I get is the barrier is more of a will to do it than it being that difficult to do. So it it probably would still be quite a big chunk of work. But as you say, I think we, we first of all, need to know, uh, have an update as to exactly where we are on it and what are, is the possibility of going down that route. Com uh, a different point, I was going to suggest, could we look at, um, again, the possibility, first of all, within council staff of car share, because this is not just something that would benefit probably save some workers money and possibly money that you know they could do without having to uh, pay it in other ways but also um, cares for the environment as well so it could be a double positive whammy so I, I think it is something that we could be looking at thank you yeah thanks Les right then um, yeah, on um, Christine's point about an organisation to bring together the various small scale community transport schemes in Swansea, like the community car schemes. Um, again, that could be set up relatively cheaply and without a huge amount of money being required. Um, Neath but Talbot have got a community transport forum that is run, if you like, under the umbrella of the council, but facilitated by CVS. Um, so in that instance, generally involved an officer, and, um, an officer attending, that would be presumably, in, in our case, from Kath Swain's department. Um, I think that, you know, with, with community transport, there's a lot that can be done, and some of it can be done relatively cheaply and straightforwardly at the other end of the spectrum a lot of what could be done may well require a lot of money but we can start off small um, set up a community transport forum bring together the existing uh, providers in the area and then once that group of people is meeting around the table there can then be a discussion about do we want to have the type of uh, bus service that um, uh, Peter was talking about in Reading, and which other local authorities along the South Wales M4 corridor have already got? Um, and it wouldn't necessarily be a huge expense to set that up because recent, well, say recently, some years ago now, the Welsh Government changed the rules so that community transport schemes can accept bus passes on the bus and then claim the money that would normally go to say First Camry or Select or whatever, the community transport organisation can claim that money back. Um, so they get the revenue for it, which really does provide them with regular income for the first time. So there's lots of you know things that could be done. Sounds great, sounds great. So yeah, I'm gonna be leaning a lot on Joe to help me timetable some, some uh, opportunities to get more information about all of these things. I think that's that's going to be really interesting. OK, thank you. I'm mindful of the time. We've just got a couple more things on the proposed work plan to discuss. So community food growing. Now, um, I know, again, this is something that uh, I think Ryland um, rose previously. I know that historically Christine has as well. Um, and it's, ju it's just one of those things that so many people seem to talk about as being a jolly good idea that the council isn't getting involved in, which is garden sharing, you know, and helping to match up people who perhaps feel a bit overwhelmed by their garden or are uninterested in their garden uh, with people who don't have enough outside space and would like to do some food growing. Um, now, I think we're in a we're in a fortunate situation now that during lockdown we saw a pilot in Swansea of of a 
essentially a garden sharing scheme called called Room to Grow. It was operating in Uplands, it is operating in Uplands, um, and it was particularly looking at front gardens and underused front gardens and, and um, taking them over and growing vegetables as a way of improving biodiversity and, and greenery um, and also just providing a space for vegetables and herbs to be grown uh, where there is currently just concrete. It's been really successful. The Lord Mayor had a visit there recently. He really liked it, was really impressed. Um, so that that's an interesting model that we could look at, at rolling out. I think they've already got perhaps agreements drawn up that could be used as a model. Um, we can look at, I, I know the comment has been made already that council houses in particular, you know, some of them have very large outdoor spaces. Um, so freeing them up for food growing is a possibility. And also, um, we suspect that there are small pieces of land around that the council is never really going to be able to do anything very constructive with. And they should basically either have trees planted on them or be used as allotments. So we could ask for a report from estates on um, pieces of land like that. And even though the council no longer supports allotments they've all been handed over to allotment associations um but then that doesn't mean that council land which isn't any use for anything else couldn't perhaps be handed over to a new allotment association or to allow current allotment associations to expand um so i think that these are pieces of work that we could probably turn around quite quickly ryland microphone ryland so i agree with everything that you've said, Mary. Um, I think the only thing that I would add to it is that whenever we get into um, some of these type of discussions, um, there are gardens available, yes, and, and um, but in the past, in one instance that I know of in Swansea, an issue was the housing department having a pile of, I don't mean it nastily, but let's be blunt, a pile of crap, uh, reasons why uh, residents couldn't lend their garden to somebody else. Um, and I think this is one of those examples of a, a situation where um, as a PDC, one of the things we could do is look to cut through the crap, make sure the council departments didn't come up with, um, you know, negative reasons as to why this couldn't be done, why that couldn't be done, why this couldn't be used, why that couldn't be done. Um, another example I'm aware of was, was again, the housing department where there were pieces of land um, that were not being built on. And people said, well, can we use this land for growing? And the housing department came back and said, well, no, we might want it for houses at some point in the future. Well, you know, for some point in the future, it might be five years away. Well, for two or three years, they could use it for growing. You know, there's so many ways in which we just got to cut through the crap. So you don't mean to offend officers, but you know, it, it's. Yeah, understood. Thank you very much. Definitely. OK, um, Hans, Peter and then Chris and then Les. OK, Peter. Yes, thank you, Barry. Just again, quickly wearing my biodiversity hat, as I always do. Um, a note of caution in relation to using any available green space for allotments. Allotments can be very good for biodiversity. Uh, those of us who grow cabbages will know only too well the interested biodiversity that can uh, take advantage of that growing. Um, so I won't say any more on that subject. But more seriously, um, we must be careful that we don't grab hold of any green space that isn't earmarked for housing or some, some similar kind of development. Uh, and as I think you indicated yourself, Mary, uh, if we can't use it for allotments, use it for trees. But I'll just uh, append a further thought to that. And I think you will know of a site I'm thinking of, a triangular site. Uh, there are also sites that we leave to a considerable extent as green uh, to allow uh, natural meadows to develop, wildflowers to develop, and so on and so forth. So whilst I welcome uh, this search for allotment space, let's be careful that we don't take more perhaps than is good for biodiversity. Thank you. Yeah, good point. Thank you. OK, Christine, next. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to, just to add really, with regard to our own housing stock and the land that may well be available for cultivation by 
residents of city and county of Swansea, I think um, there, there there is the land that's not just people's front gardens or back gardens or what have you. We've got a lot of um, sort of flats that have got shared gardens, and I know the rule, the housing rules at the moment are pretty strict about what residents can and can't do in those areas. So I think maybe we need to look at that as uh, as well. It may be to the benefit of a lot of people to have a row of beans in the, you know, at the front of the flats or, or, or what have you. Um, I certainly know of unofficial allotments that have sprung up uh, in my own ward um i uh and i they they've been they've been done on land that is council land but which is um not attended by the by by the council it was a rough piece of ground um um a, a part of, of of a wider green area that somebody has simply started growing vegetables on and I think there are probably many opportunities where side by side with wild, uh, wild planting and, you know, growing food that it can certainly happen over the over the length of breadth of city and county of Swansea. Great. OK, so um, the point about how shared space in our own yeah. housing developments is used is yeah. uh, another thing that we could discuss. Uh, would you make have you made a note of that one for me joe mm -hmm. thank you okay um i know Ryland, rylan's waving but les has been waiting patiently for a long time <laughs> i'm gonna let Les speak first sorry i just Go just going to combine both rylan's point and peter's point in that um to quash this idea oh you can't you can't grow on there because we might build on it or well, to start off we can use the ldp to identify which bits of land we've already decided and with a bit of luck the bit of land that they are pointing out we can say oh well, it's not in our local development plan so that um, chucks that argument out and I think that the um, probably one of the first things we would need to do is identify all these bits of land and as Peter suggests some of it will be leave it because it will be great for letting wildflowers diversity etc and others will be oh no this is a perfect spot nothing much gonna go but if somebody really wants to take the trouble this will be just the kind of area to um take over so as i say combination of their two points thanks thanks les yeah great thanks ryland you wanted to jump back in sorry yeah it's just to just to remind people that in um blind mice in particular there are a huge number of houses which would be good for schemes like we're talking about that are actually housing association houses and they also most of the communal land in that area of blind and mice so we were thinking of doing this type of initiative and um, we would very much have to include in that instance a housing association so that you know you didn't have a huge part of blind and mice that was left out of a scheme like this because we were only looking at council land We'd have to work with a variety of, of uh, landowners in that case. Yeah, right, OK. Uh, I know that some housing associations I've spoken to have been very interested in the Room to Grow uh, project, and I think that that kind of bodes well for a positive discussion with them about our ideas. Um, OK, I'm mindful of the time. We're on five o'clock. We're timetable to finish at five o'clock. There are just two more items I'd, I'd quite like for us to talk about. Um, on, on our proposed work plan and also I know that Amy Hawkins has only just been able to join us because she's been um, busy in other meetings um, and has missed all of the discussion so far but I did um, send her um, the, the paper that I'm referring to I don't know if she's had a chance to look at it yet uh, so Amy we've just been talking about how um, we can make sure that we are fully uh, conversant with the socio-economic duty just so that as that starts to be rolled out we're satisfied um, that the council is is doing it very well but we see that more as a role for scrutiny than for us so for us it's just an a, a fact finding thing um great and then the next thing with public transport we've got a lot of um, things that we would like to find out more about and discuss in terms of supporting community transport um, as well as understand getting a better understanding of the challenges with uh, setting up our own municipal public transport system um, on community 
food growing, which is the discussion that we were just having when you arrived, we're talking about supporting garden sharing and identifying uh, space for allotments. Um, and then we, we've got credit unions in there and the high interest credit um, action plan a high interest lending action plan already mentions credit unions and when the when our promoting affordable credit policy rolls forward uh, that will commit officers to being very clear about how we're working with credit unions going forward um so i think that a quite you know a, a less time consuming piece of work for us than some of the other things that we've discussed is just to keep abreast of that action plan and make sure that we are satisfied as a committee with the actions relating to credit unions um coming out of that um, and then finally, we want to do more work on benefit uptake and uh, we're aware that a, a pension credit take up campaign has been being discussed in the background for a very long time. It is now finally nearly ready to roll forward. We really want to make sure that um, that, that that does go ahead uh, because we, we know that officers have many demands on their time and their resources and sometimes things that get planned or discussed end up not happening. So we really want to nail down the commitment to benefit take up campaigns um, and hopefully the pension credit take up campaign will go ahead very soon and that will provide a model and some momentum that we can build on with future um, benefit take up campaigns. So we could have a session where we invite welfare rights advisors and others to give us an insight into which benefits are the most underclaimed um, or which could be, you know, the best ones for us to focus future take up campaigns on. And we can write a policy committing the council to taking forward those take up campaigns. OK, so I like I say, I'm mindful of the time. I don't know whether Amy wanted to comment on any of those things in the work plan or had any other um, suggestions for the work plan that we haven't yet had the time to discuss. So I'm just going to ask Amy to jump in now, um, or it might be that she would rather speak to us at the time about other things for the work plan. Um, yeah, appreciate the time. Thank you. Sorry, I've been in another meeting until now. So yeah, I'll pick it up another time if that's all right. But I'm, you know, it would be good wherever we can in the tackling poverty team support you with that. And I'm sure Tony said that already. So okay, thanks, Leslie. Uh, yes. Um, just want to reinforce what you've said about benefit uptake. I think um, as the name of this PD suggests, the word poverty is a bit of a clue as to what we are here to do, and it's to try and reduce poverty. And I think encouraging people to take up benefits that they are totally entitled to do is very important and for me out of all the topics we've looked at that is the number one priority followed very swiftly on by credit unions to help people borrow safely also encourage people to save and also help people who are in trouble to perhaps go and get a loan out to um, pool all their debts into one place to find it far more manageable and be able to manage their money better. So for me, those two go hand in hand. Benefit uptake, credit unions, 100%. OK, thanks, Leslie. Christine? Yes, uh, agree uh, Agree with Leslie. Just to add something, actually, with the, with the benefit take up, and I know it's not a small matter, but I think down the line a bit, maybe we need to look at um, uh, the take up for free school meals. Because my understanding is the take up for free school meals is always, you know, it, 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 it's not everyone who's entitled to it applies to have it or gets free school meals. Or even if they do, uh, then they don't take up, the, you know, the, the free school meals. And I think that's a huge part. I mean, certainly during the COVID virus. And, and I mean, at the moment, it's, it, it, it's one of the items in the news about feeding children through the, through, through the half term holidays and what have you. Uh, luckily, in Wales, we do that in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, England out on a limb at the moment. But certainly, I think the whole issue of free school meals and making sure that children get good food inside them is, is, is an important part of fighting poverty. OK, yeah, thanks, Chris. So while it's fresh in my mind um, for Anthony and Joe's benefit that the, the issue with free school meals um, is it was identified some years ago that 
eligibility is not measured in the same way as it is for other benefits um, because Welsh Government use the word eligible to basically mean that you're getting them <laughs> um, and when they talk about the eligibility gap it's not like uh, when we're talking about pension credit and under claiming where you know that someone meets the criteria but they're not accessing the benefit uh, when Welsh Government talks about free school meal under claiming um, that they're talking about the difference between being deemed eligible and actually eating that free school meal. So actually being on the list for the free school meals, but not actually consuming them. Um, so that that is something we can look at, because I know that some years ago, Swansea started basically um, a thing on behalf of families and making sure that families receive free school meals by default if they did meet the criteria for them. But that doesn't mean that everybody is actually accessing them. And we know that there is a, there is a gap there in uptake um, in as much as people who are eligible choose not to have them. Uh, so they'll, they'll take they'll take packed lunches instead, and we would like to understand more about why that is. Um, and it might might or might not be something we can actually take action on in this municipal year, but it's certainly something that we'd like to find out more about. And as Chris says, to tag that on to the whole dis discussion about uptake of benefits. Um, okay, so we're coming up to 10 past five we finished the agenda bit is there anything that anybody else wants to say before we wrap up today christine is your hand still up from before or did you want to say something else i'm very okay kind of in putting my yeah. hand i'm sorry no Chef. problem no problem <coughs> amy hello you wanted to speak hi to sorry i said there was nothing but i just remembered something else it, this is linked in with some of the work around the recovery plans around um sudden poverty as well um just in light and i'm sure you've covered this probably already so sorry if I'm repeating things but um, just in light of the situation we're in at the moment and, and just sort of unexpected poverty sudden poverty and anything we can do around that which probably will link into the work that you've mentioned but I think it might be worthwhile this committee having a, a just an eye on that as well. Yeah interesting I think the, the thing that constantly amazes me constantly is that people have no idea how low benefit levels are and at what a tiny amount of money people are expected to live on. It's, it never fails to astonish me. Um, and I think that an important piece of work could just be publicising that, publicising the fact that, you know, if you if you are a family of this type and you move on to universal credit, your income will become this, you know, and, and to make sure that people are aware of that. Um, so yeah, I think that that is definitely something that we could that we could do something on. Not quite sure what yet because you've only just mentioned it to me, but we'll think it over. <laughs> we'll think it over. Thank you. Okay, I, I just need to record uh, that I have received apologies for David Phillips. He sent us a message during this meeting to say that he's stuck in a medical appointment and he was not in a private area and able to to call in. So we've recorded his apologies for today. Um, and with that, I think we'll wrap up the meeting. So I, I really I want to thank everybody for, for joining the PDC again this year. I know we did our formal joinings at our last meeting, but it's it's um, great to have you all on board. And I'm quite excited about the work that we've got planned uh, for this year. So thanks very much to all the officers for supporting us. And uh, we'll be arranging a working group meeting on the corporate debt policy very soon um, and then timetabling in working group meetings going forward. OK, thanks very much, everybody. OK, bye. 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 See so, ya. Yeah. Cheers.